Welcome back to Ask Sam at Velasta.net. We've got a couple questions here that I want to go over. Some of these are going to lead into a more strategic or overview as to what's genetically predisposition versus what's chronic, what's an acute disease. But first of all, Sue asks, could Velasta help a child with neurofibromatosis type 1? Thank you. Quick answer is yes, but it's, it's some other discussion has to happen here. This um, this condition is uh, typically genetic, and its neurofibromin is a protein that's genetic uh, genetically produced. If you are missing that gene, um, I don't know what gene it's on. I think gene 17, but uh, or gene 11. But but anyways, it's um, if you're missing that, then you have a predisposition for tumor genosis, which is tumor growth, or genesis, which is which is tumor growth. It doesn't necessarily imply that you're going to get cancer although you're on the part of the distribution curve that pushes you towards a more likelihood of uh, getting cut cancer later on. These are typically in um, children and early adults, but there's several steps in between, and some of those steps can be interfered with to the point that they wouldn't progress from a polyp or a skin coloration directly to a, a cancer. So let's go through this a little bit. These are, um, it, it's part of a mast cell. It's also part of a, I think, a, a stat a mutation. But it's typically in the neurological side of this, in the nerve endings side. Here on, um, on step three, let me see if I can highlight this here. A nerve inju injury can elicit neuro fibroma formation and macrophages uh, in large numbers, supporting the idea that inflammation triggers the potential for a nerve tumorogenesis. We don't want the tumor growth to happen. And if we can interrupt that, and here it's a recent study show that the STAT3 signaling, which is a reactive oxygen species, species typically, so there is an inflammatory component to this. There's not a lot of work that's been done to show whether the extreme antioxidant properties of astaxanthin affect this. There is a more than a high probability that it probably does, uh, and it would suppress that signaling to stop any further progression of this disease into a carcinoma or a cancer forming polyp. So uh, the, the, the quick answer would be yes, there's no harm in trying. There's no interference with any of the other meds that you would be taking. There's no reason not to do this. And uh, if, if it is the case, then you would probably see pretty rapid changes within the next 60 days after you started the Velasta treatment. So I, I hope that's helpful. There's no reason not to do this and there's every reason to do it and that it, it could be a substantial improvement. Um, here's a um, NIH or National Institute of Health article on it. You can take a peek at that and get some idea if you can read through it. It's fairly complicated and they use all these anagrams. It does indicate that it probably is in its pathway, there's an inflammatory mode there that can be interrupted with the Velasta. Linda asks, does Velasta help with neuropathy? I'm 68, diabetic type 2. Velasta has such a high success rate in type 2 diabetics that in, in some um, areas, people are in total disbelief. I was shocked to see some of the major improvements in type 2 diabetics. 
It doesn't appear to work on type 1 diabetics, although you do get some insulin resistance improvements with type 1. They also experience insulin resistance. But uh, in type 2s, we're seeing dramatic effects. People are coming off of their metformin, off of their insulin in, um, in 30 to 60 days. But the neuropathy typically is caused by excess use of the, the insulin. Anytime you put protein, excess protein into your body, whether it's from um, uh, insulin or in some cases high sugar will cause nerves to die or, or become injured, causing these types of neuropathy. And then once you get the inflammation from that cell death or apoptosis caused by this disease, then the inflammation begins to kick in and um, it just accelerates, it, it snowballs. The snowball keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger until finally you end up with leg swelling, discoloration of the extremities. But what I wanna go over here is how to stop your type two diabetes. What we're finding, we have several hundred type 2 diabetics that are taking Velasta. They're all seeing major improvements in the, uh, their blood sugar levels. But there's some important criteria that you have to establish. Typically, the medical society wants you to take your blood sugars early in the morning. I do not recommend that. And the reason is, is because early in the morning is when your blood sugar levels oftentimes are the highest due to a phenomenon called the dawn phenomenon. And the dawn phenomenon is that uh, around four o'clock, three to five in the morning, everyone sort of comes awake. The reason is, is that you've, your body's been in a fast since the last meal. Your liver starts produce, converting glycogen into glucose uh, to get energy for the brain, for your organs, for your muscles. And it's getting ready for you to wake up. So when you get that little burst of um, glycogen conversion into glucose, it hits your brain, you come awake, and most people get up and go to the bathroom at that time. The result is a very high blood sugar reading early in the morning, say between 8 and 10 in the morning, your blood sugar levels may be higher than they are uh, fasting throughout the entire day. So, that's not going to be realistic as to where your blood sugar levels should be. The best time to take your blood sugar levels would be 30 minutes before lunch. So what you do is you, you take that number, you write down the date, and you take that num number at the same time, 30 minutes before you eat lunch. That is the number we want to track. Now, when you go on Velasta, what causes type 2 diabetes is uh, typically it's insulin resistance or misfolding of the insulin protein as your pancreas uh, and cells produce it. So when you have insulin, it's perfectly folded up just like this. So you have an insulin receptor that looks like this. And the insulin then comes down and sits perfectly in there. And that sends an electric charge down the cell membrane to the glucose channels. Now, the glucose channels are two proteins, or it's a circular uh, protein, hollow inside. And it will, when it sees that electric charge, it's typically closed. But when it sees that charge, it'll go choo -choo and open up. Now that allows sugar to flow from your bloodstream into the cells. That's the way normal cells would operate if there was no uh, 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 protein misfolding, if your protein was folded absolutely perfectly. So, but what happens when you have, a, have insulin and it has this little tiny free radical floating around there and that free radical touches that protein and steals an electron from it. That insulin protein all of a sudden goes, it opens up, it misfolds. Now, 
you have the insulin receptor on the cell, where is the functional group? Statistically, you won't find it. So if the insulin cannot make contact with that insulin receptor, that electric charge never makes it to the glucose channel. Glucose channel never opens. Sugar remains in your bloodstream, never makes it to the cell. The cell is now starving of, of glucose. It releases a protein, I believe it's called leptin. The leptin goes to the brain and says, I need more sugar. I'm not getting fed or I'm going to die. So all of a sudden your body says, I need you to go eat five Snicker bars like right now. So what happens, there's two ways sugar can be driven into the cell. One is it transfers through the glucose channels. That's the preferred method. The other one is by what's called concentration gradient. So as I increase the sugar level in the bloodstream by diffusion or concentration difference between what's in the bloodstream and what's in the cell, I might be at 600 milligrams per liter in the bloodstream and I'm only four milligrams per liter in the cell. That difference causes sugar to diffuse through the cell membrane. But the problem is that concentration in your bloodstream has to be exceedingly high to cause the, the diffusion of the sugar from the bloodstream into the cell. It is not an efficient way to provide glucose into the cell. So you end up being a diabetic. Your blood sugar levels increase in your bloodstream and that's what we measure. So simply by reducing or eliminating that little tiny free radical, we can stop the insulin resistance and allow the insulin to act normally on the cell membrane. And what we find is that after about 30 days of tracking this, we see their blood sugar levels 30 minutes before lunch get lower and lower and lower. And it, you, you have to start reducing your medications when that happens. You do not want to have a low blood sugar. So your blood sugar will, if you're taking, still taking insulin or metformin, your blood sugars will get lower and lower. You don't give insulin and metformin to people with normal blood sugars. So your blood sugar, as you normalize, will get lower and lower. It will force you to reduce the amount of insulin you're taking. And uh, after about 60 days, there's a very high probability that you may be completely off of your insulin or your diabetic medication. There's other reasons to consider metformin. Doctors can explain that to you, other health reasons. But as it relates to diet, type 2 diabetes, most type 2 diabetics can be truly cured. They can, they can no longer be type 2 diabetics. Several other things, obviously, you do not want to aggravate your, your condition by the ingestion of sugar. You want to eliminate fructose from your diet. Here. So any fruits, take them out of your diet. They're advertised as low glycemic index. The problem is when fructose is processed in the pancreas, it generates a huge concentration of the free radical of this. Fructose cannot be used by a single cell in your body, human cell. It's can, it can be used by fermenting cells, yeast and fungus in your colon, but it cannot be used by a single cell in your, in your body. Glucose can be used by every cell in your body. So some key issues here. Take your blood sugar 30 minutes before you eat lunch. Eliminate all sugars and fruits from your diet. And you'll probably lose, in, in obese conditions, you'll lose as much as five to nine pounds a week because now instead of the sugar being converted into fat through the, the triglyceride pathway, now your body will be consuming that glucose as energy and your, your appetite, your cravings will go, will go away. But it does take some discipline. 
And if, uh, if your interest truly is to stop neuropathy, start with the cause of the neuropathy. Don't try to treat the symptoms resulting from neuropathy. You will never win that battle by treating the symptom. Go after the cause. And um, I hope that has been helpful. And if, if you have more questions on it, send them in to uh, asksam at velasta.net. And hopefully um, I'll be able to address those. But, but diet, type 2 diabetes is one that we're seeing a huge success with, along with arthritis, uh, ir irritable bowel, Crohn's disease, diverticulitis, Alzheimer's. Those are the big, big hits that we're seeing now with Velasta. And with that, I'll close and keep the questions coming in. Thank you. Thank you.